Chapter Nine: The Formation of Citizenship. Liberalism, a political theory essential to representative statecraft, posits as its irreducible unit the self-determining individual, who, at the supreme moment of his sovereign power, exercises his autonomous will by choosing from among a range of options in a voting booth. Our society takes this individualistic vision with considerable seriousness, placing a premium on the sovereign person who relentlessly maximizes his or her self-interest at every turn. Such individuals are said to enjoy liberties, including freedom, from most restraints on profit-seeking. Indeed, in American ideology, freedom itself is usually conflated with a heroic individualism, independence. And autonomy, as well as entrepreneurship. Yet the much praised autonomous individual is actually a fiction. No one can be autonomous from or independent of a social nexus, be it the private life that sustains them personally, or the community life that sustains them communally. Nor is freedom accounted for only by notions of autonomy and independence, since these are mainly negative concepts of freedom from. Indeed. Of personal liberty as opposed to social freedom, far from enhancing the individual's social and political freedom, autonomy subverts it. Ultimately, autonomy negates freedom by destroying the mutual dependencies, the fabric of interrelationships, the civic and social substratum upon which freedom rests. Paradoxically, individuality, as opposed to individualism. Gains its very flesh and blood from social interdependence, not from independence, since community support and solidarity provides the context in which the individual acts. Quote, the most esteemed personal qualities, unquote, Max Horkheimer once wrote, quote, such as independence, will to freedom, sympathy, and the sense of justice are social as well as individual virtues. The fully developed individual is the consummation of a fully developed society. The emancipation of the individual is not an emancipation from society, but the deliverance of society from the atomization, an atomization that may reach its peak in periods of collectivization and mass culture.、Unquote. Least of all, does an atomized society foster the active, mature citizenship needed for a direct democracy. In today's mass societies, as we have seen, citizens are reduced to mere voters and taxpayers. Far from enhancing their mastery, the state and the capitalist system infantilize them. Conceiving itself as a paterfamilias, the state manages civic life on their behalf, presumably for their own good, but thereby perpetuates their dependence and subordination. At the same time, capitalism leaves no stone unturned in rendering them hapless. Insatiable consumers, hungry not for power but for bargains. The citizens' is very passivity, their very contingency to state processes, leaves them vulnerable to manipulation, be it by powerful personalities or by powerful institutions. Mass voting in the privacy of a booth is but a pale substitute for an active political life. Here, personal preferences for candidates are registered, tabulated, and quantified. Like consumers' preferences in a market research survey, then processed in order to devise more effective marketing strategies for the next set of candidates. In order to enlarge citizen participation and democracy itself, some observers have proposed expanding the use of democratizing in inverted commas tools, like the referendum, in which people vote on specific issues, but referenda merely offer pre-formulated options. They do not allow for the collective formulation of policies or the expression of a broad range of possibilities. As with mass voting for candidates, mass voting for referenda continues the degradation of political participation into the mere registration of preferences. It debases citizens into consumers, broad ideals into personal tastes, and political ideas into percentages. No reality could be more distant from the liberal ideal of the self-determining autonomous individual, in command of himself and his environment, than passive consumers of paternalistic statist options. Yet the ideal of autonomy is the prevailing ideology 
for in today's mass societies, deeply compromised as they are by the state, urbanization, hierarchy and capitalism. As such, the ideology is not merely a sham, it is a cruel joke. Citizenship Libertarian municipalism proposes that passive dependence on an elite state is not, after all, the final condition of human political existence. A more active way of being is possible, it maintains, precisely because of some of the features that distinguish human beings as social, especially their capacity for reason, their mutual dependence and their need for solidarity. Their independence and solidarity in particular can be the psychological, indeed moral groundwork for citizenship, and thus for the recreation of the political realm and municipal direct democracy. Creating a libertarian municipalist society depends ultimately on changing social relations. Replacing the state, urbanization, hierarchy and capitalism with direct democratic, cooperative institutions grounded in the municipal political realm. But its success also depends on the characterological qualities of the individual citizens who create that society. Such a society would require a different kind of character from that of passive taxpayers and voters. Citizens who are active and innovative inhabitants of the political realm would develop a set of character strengths, civic virtues and commitments to the common good that are either not widespread today or not much trumpeted where they are. Such personal qualities would form the character structure for mature citizens capable of democratic political participation. Of these virtues, the most important are solidarity and reason. Indeed, the existence of the community depends on the community's ability to entrust its future to the solidarity and rationality of each citizen. By any definition, citizenship presupposes a commitment to the public good, that is, to solidarity. In contrast to the cynicism that prevails today, mature active citizens would understand that the perpetuation of their political community depends on their active support for and participation in it. They would understand that they owe duties and obligations to their community, and they would fulfil them with the knowledge that everyone in the community was bound by the same set of obligations. They would understand that precisely their common effort and shared responsibility were making the community possible. Reason, another quality that is much aligned today, would also be of crucial importance to a direct democracy. Citizens' ratiocinative faculties would be vitally needed so that they would weigh the best course of action that the community should take to address a particular problem. Reason would be necessary for constructive discussion. In deliberations over an issue, rather than emotion-laden, visceral partisanship. Reason would be indispensable for overcoming any personal prejudices that citizens might have, so that they could treat all of their fellow citizens with fairness and generosity. Should an attempt be made to revive a private property and an entrepreneurial profit-seeking spirit, citizens would need reason to recognise why those efforts must be vigorously resisted, especially since emotionally compelling appeals would doubtless be made to their self-interest. They would need reason, as well as a great deal of personal strength and character, in order to be strong enough to uphold the good of the community. This is not to say that in a libertarian municipalist society, individual men and women must be wholly self-sacrificing and subordinate selves to the collectivity. On the contrary, each individual would certainly live in a personal domain as well with intimate family members and with the friends and fellows one chooses as companions, and with co-workers in productive activities. Indeed, in the empowered municipal community, personal relationships would probably be far more enriching than they are today, where neighbours often scarcely know each other, and where the nuclear family, in isolation, must do all the personal work to support the individual, work that was once shared by the wider community and the extended family, The very condition of the interdependence implies a degree of reciprocity among individuals. As fellow participants in a bold experiment, citizens rely on one another to share their responsibilities. As they become more worthy of one another's trust, they could come to trust one another. Indeed, individuality and community would mutually create each other.
the communal decisions that individual citizens made would in turn shape the social context in which they themselves lived. The political domain would reinforce the personal by empowering it, while the private domain would reinforce the political by enriching it. In this reciprocal process, the individual and the collective would nourish each other, rather than subordinate one to the other. Despite the many differences that existed between them, the citizens of the ancient Athenian democracy in general perceived citizenship as the most authentic form of self-expression, rather than a burden of obligatory self-denial. They believe that human beings are inherently political beings, and that political participation is part of their human nature. They expressly frowned upon a politics that placed private interests before the public good. The collective recognition of duty and responsibility shared by all was underpinned by collective feelings of considerable solidarity and a commitment to reason. More than two millennia later, a version of this notion found expression in the maxim of the first socialist international, quote, no rights without duties, no duties without rights, unquote, that social anarchists and Marxists alike adopted as part of the ethics of revolutionary socialism. Paidia. If state authority rests on the assumption that the citizen is inherently an incompetent and unreasonable juvenile whose affairs must be handled by professionals, libertarian municipalism assumes quite the opposite. It considers every citizen as potentially competent and reasonable enough to participate directly in democratic politics. It presupposes that with training and experience, citizens can deliberate, make decisions peacefully and implement their choices responsibly. It considers politics too important to be left to professionals. Instead, it must become the province of amateurs, of ordinary people. Such an orientation toward amateurism, as we have seen, was pervasive in the Athenian polis. With only a few exceptions, office holders there were chosen not by election but by sortition, that is, by lot. Most officials were selected essentially at random on the principle that every citizen was politically competent to handle the demands of most offices. An amateur politics thus presumes that citizens have attained a high degree of political maturity, such that no elite of specialists, in inverted commas, is responsible for governance. The practices and virtues necessary for citizenship, however, do not spring the human spirit ab novo. Rather, like any form of civilised behaviour, they result from careful instruction. To some extent, children learn these practices in their families. The very young are often taught to give and take and to share, while older children may learn self-reliance and critical thinking. But for the most part, the specific virtues and competencies of citizenship must be consciously cultivated through a specific political education, which includes character formation. The Athenians called this education paideia, the intentional cultivation of the civic and ethical qualities necessary for citizenship. These qualities include not only ethical virtues, but a mature identification with the community and its values, and a sense of responsibility toward it. Paideia imparts the reasoned restraint and decorum necessary to keep a civic assembly orderly, tolerant, functional and creative. Such civilising, in inverted commas, is what transforms a group of self-interested individuals into a deliberative, rational, ethical body politic. How and where is this paideia carried out? Academic study in the schoolroom is inadequate while the mass media, far from fostering paideia, are capable only of undermining it. Actually, the school for citizenship and the character structure that sustains it is the political realm itself. Citizenship is created during the course of democratic political participation, amid a plenitude of discussion and interaction that engender knowledge, training, experience and reason. In the very process of decision-making, the citizen develops both as an individual and as a political being for citizens are the result of their own political activity. The school of politics, in effect, is politics itself. Ultimately, however, the development of citizenship would become an art, not merely an education. 
Every aesthetic and institutional means would be used to turn the latent competence of citizens into actual reality. Social and political life would be consciously orchestrated to foster a profound sensitivity for the adjudication of differences without denying the need for vigorous dispute when it is needed. Cooperation and civic responsibility would become expressions of sociability and interdependence. Citizenship Today Perhaps the greatest task that the emerging libertarian municipalist movement faces will be to consciously revive and expand the ethical traditions of citizenship and create a public sphere that can inculcate them. In our era of anomie and egoism, to be sure, the task seems formidable. The virtues and practices of active citizenship are alien to many people today. Cynicism about politics, in inverted commas, is epidemic, and any suggestion that one might put the common good, in inverted commas, before one's personal interests, let alone the interests of one's family, is likely to be greeted with mockery. Distrust of and even hostility toward politics, in inverted commas, runs very deep. Yet closer examination reveals that the object of popular resentment is not politics but the state. Moreover, resentment of the state is healthy and legitimate, since the state represents a set of masters, not the common good. Unfortunately, so identified is politics with statecraft today, that for many people hostility to the state poisons their attitude toward politics. They become hostile to the very precepts that could empower them, that could replace their anomy with community and their social weakness with empowerment. Still, the task of recreating a civic ethics may not be as formidable as it may seem at first glance. The very process of reclaiming citizen power and creating a libertarian municipalist society could become popular by providing sustenance for today's widespread hunger for meaning. It could endow privatised, aimless-seeming lives with a sense of purpose, so that people have something beyond self-gratification to live for. They could mobilise all their strengths and talents, and in the process grow in ways they could never have predicted. The fulfilment of the movement's aims would create a better society in which children could live creatively and with a sense of solidarity rather than with anxiety, passivity and resignation. The movement must therefore offer more than an electoral platform in opposition to urbanisation and the nation-state. It must offer an ethical ideal that not only casts moral judgement on the abuses of the existing society, but reflects the virtues of citizenship. It must offer a replacement for the vacuity and triviality of life today in the form of radical ideals of solidarity and freedom. Like the great manifestos advanced by socialist movements in the last century, it must call for moral as well as material transformation, with an ethics that sustains both. Civic education and paideia are integral to the libertarian municipalist movement in all stages, from the study group to the municipal assembly and confederation. The movement should begin the process in its first discussion groups and lecture forums, in open discussions in cafes and restaurants, in homes, wherever people gather, and especially within the movement itself, at its own meetings. Here, people inexperienced in political mores may become accustomed to airing their political views in public, in the presence of their neighbours, and debating them rationally. When citizens' assemblies are established, Paideia will continue there, on a more formal basis, where responsibility and solidarity will become crucial in formulating public policy. Precisely because it is conducted on a person-to-person -person basis, such civic education will make for personal interaction and trust, and the solidarity necessary for citizenship. Serious and ongoing political participation will help to eliminate prejudices and parochial sensibilities and replace them with cooperation and a recognition of mutual interdependence. As people become active citizens, they will learn to relearn the meaning of loyalty to their fellows, while their commitment to achieving success for the cause will deepen and intensify their courage and generosity of spirit. Reinforced by ongoing political participation, Paideia will intensify 
as the municipal assemblies attract ever more citizens, accumulate ever more power, and spread ever more widely into other municipalities. Still, these developments would only be a starting point. Serious participation in any struggle for social restructuring is self-formative and self-empowering. Having undergone a process of civic education, the people who begin the process of creating the movement will themselves have been transformed into more politically mature beings by the time they complete their work.